Have you ever heard someone pose the question, uh, how do you know if you're on the right side of history? Uh, it's a question that, that seems to get thrown around in our culture, especially with respect to some of the biggest and most sort of polarizing issues of our day. You know, things like uh, Israel or Palestine, uh, choice or life, AI or HR. Um, but I think the question reflects uh, a tension, sort of a decision-making or discernment tension that we can also feel in our day-to-day -day lives, the day-to-day -day, day -day decisions we face all the time. You know, maybe, maybe as parents, like private school or public, which one's the right path to take? Uh, or as students, you know, gap year or go straight to college? Or, or in our wallets or with our credit cards every day? Do we try to save or do we just keep on spending? You know, and then there's the really dicey ones, right? Android or iPhone, or Leafs or Habs, or Taylor or whatever is the opposite of a Swifty. You know, how do you know if you're on the right side of history? Well, today, as we uh, continue our journey through the story of the early church in the book of Acts, that is the question that is on the table amidst the highest of stakes. Um, if you've been following along as we go through these passages in, in your own Bible, we're going to be picking things up in Acts chapter 5, uh, where coming out of the cautionary tale of Ananias and Sapphira that we heard about last week, the writer Luke now provides another snapshot of the church being the church, as he kind of segues from one episode to the next. He tells again of many wonders and signs being experienced among the people and, and all kinds of people being healed in this, in this community, in this Jesus movement. But he also includes an interesting paradoxical note about people's kind of responses or reactions as he makes this segue. In verses 13 and 14, he writes this, he says, no one else dared join them, them being the believers of the Jesus community. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. But then he says, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. On the one hand, uh, Luke says that, that those watching the church Perhaps, especially in light of now what they had heard about Ananias and Sapphira's deaths, so, some were watching with kind of this, this caution or, or reverence, almost a, you know, a fear of whether they would actually jump in. Well, on the other hand, it says there were more and more people that just couldn't help falling in love with Jesus. You know, you know to me, it kind of feels like imagine a crowd standing together near a bungee jumping platform where you probably have one group of people that are kind of like leaning in and interested and curious and would actually be interested in the experience, where on the other hand, others would step back in kind of reverence or fear. But kind of regardless of what side people were on with respect to the Jesus movement, uh, there was awe and there was reverence, but everyone was holding them in high regard. Everyone, that is, uh, except for the religious leaders of the day. Continuing here in verse 17, it says, uh, Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, this was a party of the, the Jewish religious council, it says that they were filled with jealousy. And so they arrested the, the apostles and they put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. As the religious leaders of the day um, watched the Jesus movement continue to gain momentum, to see more and more people sort of choose the Jesus side, their hearts were filled with jealousy. And so they set out to, to put a stop to this movement. Actually, as their, their second attempt, having already uh, warned the apostles Peter and John to stop speaking in the name of Jesus back in Acts chapter 4, now it says that they threw the apostles, and it's understood they threw kind of all the apostles together into jail, into prison. But what we see in this story, in this beginning of this episode, is that even that didn't slow down the movement because kind of miraculously or unexplainably, an angel of the Lord 
or in the, the little literal translation, it says, a messenger of the Lord came in the night and released them, helped them escape, encouraging them to go right back to the temple to keep telling people about this new life in Jesus. That as this movement continues, we see that, that prison, even prison guards or prison walls couldn't slow down the movement of the church. And then uh, this is where the question about trying to discern kind of the right side of history really started to gain some steam. As once the temple guards discovered uh, that the apostles were right back in the temple courts sharing about Jesus, they went there and they arrested them again, now bringing them in front of the religious council for questioning. Where we'll pick it up in verse 27, where it says, uh, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin, which is the name for the, the Jewish council, to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood, referring to Jesus. Then it says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Friends, in the midst of intensifying threats and pushback, threats of prison or even worse, the Apostle Peter got up and he, he declares on behalf of all the apostles as well as sort of all the followers of Jesus that they fully intend to obey God rather than humans. That they are committed to pursuing uh, God's side of history no matter what obstacles or opposition they may face. And notice here, um, it's not just because of something they were, they were brought up in or, or have believed in or, or read about. It's actually because of what they've experienced, what they've witnessed. Remember that these apostles, they had been with Jesus right from the beginning of his ministry. And then they actually watched as Jesus was crucified to death at the hands of the Romans. And then against all odds, and frankly, all of their own expectations, they encountered Jesus risen and alive, witnessing him and, and hanging out with him as resurrected from the dead. It said hundreds of people witnessed and experienced Jesus' risen life until he ascended into the heavenly realm. And because of all they had witnessed, and all that they were now continuing to witness through the work of the Holy Spirit. They insisted that Jesus was alive and that Jesus was their Lord. And so they were going to follow and walk in his way no matter what. And this really brings us to the climax of today's story. Um, because Peter's response made these religious leaders absolutely furious, seething. And they wanted now to put all these apostles to death. They were ready to skip the warnings, skip the prison sentences, and just put an end and a stop to this movement once and for all. But I want to actually just call a time out here for a moment um, to just reflect on uh, the spirit of these religious leaders um, and to recognize that probably we need to understand, especially from a first century Jewish cultural perspective, that, that these religious leaders weren't just inherently bad or evil people. They were seen as the, the experts in the law. You know, the spiritual leaders and guides of the people. They were seen as the ones who best understood God's plans and purposes as recorded in their Hebrew Bible. They were essentially the keepers of God's history. And um, because Jesus, sort of nothing about Jesus 
and nothing about his movement lined up with their understanding or their interpretations or their expectations. They felt this deep spiritual responsibility to shut down this movement so that they wouldn't find themselves on the wrong side of history, God's history as they understood it. And that is in the sort of climax of this scene until one leader among them um, really slowed down long enough and paused to reflect on the big picture to consider how can we know if we're on the right side of history? In verse 34, we read this. It says, but a Pharisee, who's part of another group of this religious council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the apostles be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin saying, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. Um, There's another translation says in that phrase, the whole movement came to nothing. After him, uh, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Friends, picture this. Um, In the heat of the moment, uh, as tempers were flaring and threats were being uttered, This Pharisee named Gamaliel uh, stood up in the room to to try to reflect on the big picture. Gamaliel, who it says, uh, was honored by all the people. In fact, uh, Gamaliel, you kind of learn a little bit about him. He was considered the most respected and most revered Pharisee of all, Uh, not just of his lifetime, but kind of throughout their history. And as a result, uh, the, the room gave him their attention. Now, to me, part of what's interesting about uh, Gamaliel's reflection and response here is that he doesn't end up quoting from their scriptures. In this case, actually responding quite differently than, than Peter that we learned about a couple of weeks ago, who was seeing how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament prophecies and promises. But here instead, like I mentioned, um, because everything about Jesus sort of flew in the face of these religious leaders' understanding of of, uh, their Bible and their understanding up until that point, um, he took a different approach. And he paused to consider what they had been witnessing in the world and what they had experienced from some movements that had felt similar. He references two men here, uh, Theodos and Judas, Coincidentally, kind of rhyming in their names. Uh, Two men who had apparently attempted to inspire and start movements of their own. And like Jesus, each of these men were killed at the hands of the state, likely crucified by the Romans as well. But then Gamaliel goes on to remind the religious council of how the followers of these movements, they were actually scattered after the deaths of their leaders eventually causing the movements to come to nothing. So he assumed if uh, this is the same kind of human movement, it's ultimately going to face the same kind of fate. But Gamaliel was also kind of discerning and reflective enough to consider that maybe this movement was different. That maybe there was more going on here. You see, in response to Jesus' death, Um, the Jesus movement was actually growing and not shrinking. More and more Jesus followers were were gathering and not scattering. Um, 
And for even a little more comparison, kind of beyond uh, the men referenced here in these movements, Theodos and Judas, frankly, in the first century, even kind of within Jesus's lifetime, there would have been hundreds, if not thousands, of Jewish kind of so-called movement starters or revolutionaries who had been executed, many of them crucified at the hands of the Romans. This kind of crucifixion was disturbingly common, and the Romans would stamp out their movements one after the next. And so Gamaliel assumed, if this is one of those, it will be over soon enough. But, and this was the big but of the story, if it is from God, he says, this one will not be stopped Finishing out the story here in verse 40, it says his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. They they were beaten. Then they ordered them again not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Given the discerning and reflective wisdom and warning from Gamaliel, you know, about considering what side of God's history they may find themselves on, um, the council decided to release the apostles with sort of only a beating. Um, And strangely, it says the apostles, they they found a great joy in this, that they went away rejoicing, that because of the name of Jesus, they had now participated in a taste of the suffering that Jesus himself had endured, had endured, and that they were so convinced and so committed to their witnessing of Jesus as their Lord, that no matter what they faced, they were not going to stop living and leading and pursuing this movement together. That's the sort of episode of the story of the early church that we're looking at this week. And as we we lean into it and seek to learn from it together, it makes me wonder what What can it tell us and what might it mean for our faith some 2,000 years later, especially when we wrestle with our own discernment or even the biggest questions of how do we know if we're on the right side of history? And the first thing I want to say, reflecting on the nature of this movement of the church, is that, you know, some 2,000 years later, you know, from a few thousand believers in and followers of Jesus at the time of this story, today, it's estimated that there are around 2.4 billion people kind of in our world today who proclaim faith in Jesus, who describe Jesus as their Lord and would testify to experiencing some of the healing and saving work of Jesus in their lives. That very unlike Theodos and Judas, who you may maybe have only heard of for the first time today, um, this movement has not stopped. That Jesus' name is still known and expanding around the world. In fact, if you're at a place where um, you would really just kind of still be exploring uh, what the church is all about um, or, or looking into who Jesus is and considering his claims and maybe, maybe wrestling with some of his claims, maybe especially wrestling with this idea of, of his resurrection, which I'd want to say is a, is a legitimate intellectual and emotional and theological wrestling match. What I'd want to suggest to us today of what might be one of the greatest encouragements to our faith, or maybe evidence of, of the, what it was witnessed through these stories, the witness of the resurrection of Jesus, is simply the fact that we have even heard of Jesus at all. Because unlike, you know, those hundreds if not thousands of so-called Jewish revolutionaries that would have been killed in similar ways in the first century, and movements who were stamped out, and people we had never heard of, um, The Jesus movement continues. The Jesus name is still known. And people across the globe still testify to Jesus as their Lord and Savior and experiencing and participating his saving work, 
in their lives. And what I want to suggest to us today is that I believe that Jesus is God's side of history. That Jesus is what God is up to in the world. That Jesus and his movement is where things are going as God's side of history. And that we are invited to keep uh, putting our faith in and aligning our lives with this unstoppable movement of God. Participating in the, the healing and the love and the saving work that he is up to in the world. And will continue without stopping. And I think as well, when it comes to discerning, how do we do that? How do we live into that? How do we see and, and uh, discern what Jesus is up to in our day, in our midst, or in our community? I think there's a few clues in this story as well that we can lean on. I think when it comes to uh, discerning the Jesus movement, first, we need to remember that it is a movement that is built on devotion, We've talked about this already in this series, but we see it once again in the beginning of this episode where these followers are just fully devoted to the awe and wonder of what Jesus is up to and doing life together. And it's like, it's like standing on the edge of that bungee jumping platform knowing you're going to need to put your faith in a harness and a cord, and a cord that you know, following Jesus requires that kind of trust and devotion to go all in on it. I think second, when it comes to discerning the sort of movement and work of Jesus, we can always trust that it tends toward healing and release, toward healing and recovery and freedom in people's lives, maybe even sometimes in ways that we can't quite explain or that we couldn't have expected. But when we hear and see stories of, of healing and release and recovery, and especially when people are giving the credit to Jesus, uh, we can be confident that Jesus is up to work in their lives and in their community. And building off that, that discerning the Jesus movement means it's always about him and not us. That when we experience this activity in our lives, we're always redirecting the credit to Jesus. That uh, this movement is about centering Jesus and de-centering ourselves for the sake of his love flowing more freely in the world. That unlike the religious leaders who were filled with jealousy at their own power and influence being threatened, we constantly surrender that to make it about Jesus and not about ourselves. And finally, what we see in this story especially in the end and final outcome for these apostles, is that it's a movement that involves sacrifice. That even if Jesus is God's side of history, um, that even if this is a movement that cannot and will not be stopped, it seems to be a movement that comes with a cost. And a cost that uh, at times may, may not make it always feel like the right side of history may not always make it feel like it's working or winning in the ways we usually measure such things. Um, but it's a cost that has no greater demonstration or, or payment of that price than through the very sacrifice of Jesus, the ultimate payment of the cost of Jesus, giving up his life on the cross for the sake of the world, to have God's movement be initiated in history and through rising again to bring his love, his grace, his freedom, his forgiveness into the world that we are invited to participate in and that will not be stopped. As I was reflecting kind of on this story, um, and preparing for this this week, I was reminded of a story and experience in my own life. Uh, 15 years ago, actually, when I, when I first came on staff uh, here at our church. And uh, when I first came onto our staff team, um, my role was to be a part of helping launch our multi-site locations as we were becoming a, a multi-site community. Um, and our multi-site vision and journey, it really began and, and started to take off because of uh, some uh, core members of our church family who were so devoted to Jesus and what he was up to among us that they wanted to more practically live out sort of his missional life and way uh, in their neighborhood, in their community, particularly a group of people from the Welland and Pelham area. 
And so as we sort of followed what we sensed Jesus was up to and we prepared to launch uh, this new Southridge location in Welland, um, Ben Lockyer, who was part of our staff leadership at the time, um, and I were invited to a luncheon with a variety of pastors from the Welland area. And I think this was like my, my second or third month on the job. And I remember just how excited I was to, to meet and connect with these other ministry leaders who, you know, we were going to be working alongside together for the sake of Jesus's kingdom. Um, that was until only a few minutes into the lunch um, when we found out that the room was actually quite frustrated with us and had invited us to kind of ask us all kinds of questions and, and present all kinds of skepticism and, and even discouragement as to why we would think we would feel any need to kind of plant or launch a Southridge congregation in their city. Now, to be fair uh, to those feelings and reactions, so I reflect on it almost many years later, I, I'm sure we could have done a better job um, communicating or collaborating or connecting in advance, been praying together and uh, sharing and discerning how we sense Jesus was leading us or what Jesus was up to in this, this you know, part of our church community. But at the same time, uh, the experience was quite jarring, especially in my quite new and naive uh, enthusiasm about the work of God that I was now getting freed up and, and paid to be a part of leading in our church, but that was now confronted with some real strong feelings and pushback. Um, and that was all until uh, a member of the group, about halfway through the lunch, uh, stood up. It was someone who seemed to have some clout with the room, maybe had been a part of this group for a long time. And he actually referenced the very story of Gamaliel. Reference the wisdom and discernment, patience and openness that's displayed in this story. Saying that what, if what Southridge was doing was of their own initiative, it, it likely wouldn't last long. Maybe it wouldn't even really come to fruition or get off the ground. Um, but if Jesus is in it, who are any of us to stand in its way? And frankly, it was the first time I'd really noticed or heard of Gamaliel. I'd probably read through Acts before. Um, but although I wasn't really familiar with this story, I found myself actually experiencing the grace and the patience and the discernment and openness to what Jesus might be up to, even if it's not quite what we may expect, that encouraged us to continue following what we sensed Jesus was doing in our lives and in our community. And while in this case, kind of that experience, that story may only be 15 years later, these days, uh, as a little shout out to our well location, when I, when I hear the stories or I see the pictures, and we have a few we can share here, or have my own kind of up close and personal experiences with all that God is up to in our well and location, especially through initiatives like our Harvest Kitchen or Collective Kitchen, um, Community Garden, Produce Market, recent baptisms, including, you know, through future dreams and visions for ways our Welland property can, can meet the needs of the people of Welland. Um, I can't help but feel like God is still just getting started in working out his movement among us. And I don't share that story to make any of it about us, but frankly, to keep making it all about Jesus, about his way, about his side of history, and about his movement. And frankly, just because of the way it reminds me and inspires me that when Jesus said to his first followers, to these same apostles, before his death and resurrection, that he would build his church and even the powers of hell would not stop it. I believe Jesus meant it. I believe that promise holds true today. And that is the promise we can cling to as a community to keep aligning our lives with the Jesus movement as God's side of history in our day. So may we be a community that keeps building our lives on devotion to Jesus. May we lean into and participate in the stories of healing and release among us. May we always be giving Jesus the credit, making it about him and not about us. And may we be willing to endure through the sacrifice and the cost because of the sacrifice and price that Jesus has paid for us to experience his life of love together as our unstoppable Lord and Savior. Let's pray together.
Jesus, we thank you for who you are, all you have done, and all you are doing. Um, we are here because of you. And as we find ourselves living in this moment of history in our, our individual and personal lives and also in our lives together, um, we want to align our lives with your movement, with your will and your way. And thank you for the gift of your church as we're inspired by its stories from its earliest days, but then also considering how we are a part of it today and how it keeps advancing and moving in the world. Would you continue your work among us? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.